Greetings and welcome to lecture number three on basic circuit theory. I am Beza Rozavi. Uh, today we will uh, continue to look at electric devices and in particular spend a bit of time on dependent current sources and then go to resistors and Ohm's law and that will prepare us for the concept of IV characteristics uh, which are critical in our studies of many different types of devices in this course and in the future. But before we go there, let's uh, take a quick look at what we covered in the last lecture. So what we saw was that uh, uh, we talked about electric devices such as wires, switches, independent and dependent voltage sources, and current sources. And uh, in particular, we saw that a voltage source is a two-terminal device that uh, can deliver any current uh, and maintain its voltage. So the current can be positive or negative, and uh, it is an ideal voltage source. It wants to enforce this voltage in all conditions. For a current source, on the other hand, we saw that it wants to push a certain amount of current regardless of the voltage that we develop here. That voltage could be positive or negative, and this current source always wants to push a current equal to I1 in this direction into the circuit. Uh, it's important to understand that neither this nor this uh, satisfies Ohm's law. Ohm's law relates the current and voltage of a resistance. So these two do not satisfy that because they can have an arbitrary current here or an arbitrary voltage here. All right, we also saw this equivalence, which is uh, critical in our understanding for the future. We saw that a switch that is in the off position or is open is equivalent to an open circuit because it doesn't allow any current to flow. And that's also equivalent to a current source whose value is zero. A current source whose value is zero guarantees that this current is zero, and that's equivalent to an open circuit and equivalent to a switch that's open. Similarly, a switch that is uh, turned on or is closed, is conducting, is equivalent to a short circuit, and that is equivalent to a zero volt voltage source, because such a voltage source guarantees a zero difference between these two points, which would be the same as across a short circuit or across a switch that is closed or is turned on. So it's important to remember these equivalencies for the future. Okay, so let's uh, go back to today's lecture and uh, talk about dependent current sources. So we saw that a, an independent current source is one who wants to, that wants to impress its current on a circuit regardless of the voltage that uh, it has. So how about a dependent current source? So I'm going to write this as a dependent uh, current uh, sources. So just the way we saw how voltage uh, sources act operated when they are dependent, we have a similar situation here. So we have a current source, again denoted by a diamond with this direction. We can call it something, so call it I1. And this current source has a value that depends on some other parameters somewhere else. So, for example, I could have uh, some branches of various devices over here. And this all belongs to a giant circuit. And this current source may say that my current is equal to, uh, for example, this current here. and call this I0. This is my current will be K times I0. K can be any number, positive, negative, greater than 1, less than 1. It just copies that current and scales it by a factor of K. So it, this current source wants to imitate uh, this current. And uh, dependent current sources are useful in modeling certain devices such as transistors, as you might see in courses on electronics. But uh, our objective right now is just to get comfortable with this uh, concept. Okay. Now here we said that this current is a multiple of another current in the circuit, 
But it could be that this current is also a multiple of a voltage in other part of the circuit, right? It could depend on a voltage. So let's draw that as well here, again, conceptually. So suppose we have a some circuit like this, and there's a voltage here, call it V0. And it just happens that we have a dependent current source here, I1. And uh, these all belong to a big circuit. And this I1 says my value is given by this voltage source times a constant. So K times V0. So I1 is equal to K times V0. It's a little strange, right, that the current would depend on a voltage. Uh, but uh, also interesting is the fact that uh, these two have different dimensions. So K cannot be unitless. K has to have a dimension. What is the dimension of K? Well, I, according to Ohm's law, if you remember, is equal to V over R. So K has a unit of 1 over resistance, and we have to remember that, has a dimension of 1 over resistance. All right? But for now, it's okay. Okay, so now that we have these dependent current sources, we can try to build circuits using these dependent current sources. Again, these are models of some advanced devices such as transistors, and see what those circuits can do. Maybe they can do some interesting things. So, as an example, uh, let me show you what we could do. So, let's look at an example here. Okay, so I have, uh, I will build a circuit like this. Here's an input signal, call it V in. So this input signal, for example, could be my voice that enters this microphone and becomes an electric uh, signal, a voltage. So it's coming in here. And uh, we will take a dependent current source, I1. And we make this dependent current source imitate this voltage. So this current source will be equal to K times V1, V in. All right? So the current source as a function of time has the same shape as the voltage source, except that uh, the units are different and uh, the, the result will be in the current domain. It will have uh, the unit of uh, current, like amperes, rather than the unit of voltage. All right, and now we will pass this current through a resistor, like so. Let's call this resistor R1. And we have a current going through a resistor, so we generate a voltage. So let's call this voltage V out. And we want to see uh, what happens. So this, these pens sometimes do not uh, cooperate. All right. <clears throat> okay, so very simple, right? I have a voltage coming from a microphone. I made a current source that is dependent upon that voltage by a coefficient of K. I let the current flow through R1. I would like to see how much V out I get. Well, that's easy, right? Because uh, this current is flowing from uh, the positive side to the negative side, from high potential to low potential. So according to Ohm's law, V out is just the current times the resistor. So I can write V out is equal to R1 times the current, which is K times V in. So if we look at this result carefully, we see something interesting. We see that V out, this voltage, is a copy of V in, except that it's scaled by some factor, K times R1. K R1 doesn't have a unit because K has a dimension of 1 over resistance, so this has, a, has no unit. But what this tells us is that if I can make K R1 greater than 1, then this circuit amplifies. It takes an input voltage and multiplies it by 5, 10, 100, whatever we want. So that's how we would put an amplifier to amplify my voice as it enters this microphone and becomes an electric voltage. So this microphone, in fact, is immediately followed by an amplifier 
that works uh, based on this principle. So we say that the circuit can act as acts as an amplifier. So we see that uh, having a dependent current source is actually quite useful uh, because we can build many different functions out of it, uh, one of which is amplification. All right, so uh, let's uh, look at another example to see what we can do here. So, uh, example. So in this case, I am going to take a voltage source. So call it a Vx. And I will apply that to a dependent current source, I1. Okay, and I will make this current source just proportional to this voltage. So K times V in. You see the difference between these two cases? Here the voltage was between these two terminals and the current was generated and pushed through this resistor. Here, the voltage between these two terminals and this current is generated like before, except that it's connected to the same voltage source, not to a different place, different port, different terminals. So we just want to see what this is. Uh, sorry, this should be KVX. We just want to see what this is. Does this do something interesting? Uh, uh, what to, type of operation do we have? So in fact, let's try to do something simple. Let's try to plot Ix as a function of Vx, right? Very simple. So Vx goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, and I would like to plot Ix as a function of Vx. So what does it look like? All right, well, uh, what we know is that uh, Ix as a function of Vx uh, can actually be expressed as, uh, as you can see here, Ix is the same current as the current of uh, I1. So I can say that Ix is equal to kvx. That's all this the dependent current source is doing. It's trying to draw a current from this voltage source proportional to this voltage source. The proportionality factor is k. All right, so if you plot this, you just get a straight line. Does this result remind us of anything that we know? Yes, it looks like a resistor, right? For a resistor, we have I is equal to V over R. So here we have I as a function of V, it's a straight line. So I can say that uh, uh, Ix is equal to Vx over some R, some equivalent R, R E Q. That's how it would look for a resistor of value REQ. And how much is REQ? If I just compare this with this, I see that REQ is nothing but REQ is equal to K, 1 over K. So, weird but true. Uh, this little circuit here acts like a resistor. Is that useful, not useful? Well, it depends. It depends on what we're doing. Sometimes it is actually useful. But the point is that uh, if, if you build a little circuit like this, a dependent current source that follows the voltage applied across it, then it looks like a resistor. All right. Okay, so let's see what else we can do here. Uh, let's move on to the next component of interest, namely resistors, and talk about Ohm's law. Of course, you have seen these before. Uh, but I, uh, I'm going through them again just so that uh, you get comfortable with these ideas. Let's go to this uh, green color here. All right, so resistors and Ohm's law. Okay. All right, so uh, we know that a resistor has the following symbol, 
R and Ohm says that if a current I is flowing from this side to this side it generates a voltage uh, like so so the way to memorize this is that the current always flows from the high, high potential to low potential, right? And V is equal to I R. So this is Ohm's law, and that's the behavior of a resistor. So uh, that's simple enough. Uh, but uh, when we build a resistor, we have uh, different options. Uh, how do we build a resistor anyway? Well, it's, uh, in principle, it's pretty simple, right? We just take a... A rectangular cube like this we attach a wire on this side we attach a wire on the other side and this becomes a resistor we have resistance between this terminal and this terminal and uh, the value of the resistor is given by uh, the uh, length of this structure so this length from here to here length divided by uh, the cross-section area of the structure this cross-section area here so let's call that a a and also a factor that depends on the material that we use some materials are more resistive than others for example carbon is more resistive than metal so if you build this out of carbon we have a high resistance and that is reflected by a coefficient of rho that we place here. Rho is called the resistivity of the material. Resistivity. So depending on whether we're looking for a low resistance, let's say some ohms, tens of ohms, or a high resistance, kilo ohms or mega ohms, of course we will use different types of material here. Okay, so this says that uh, the longer the structure is, the larger the resistance. It also says that the wider or the larger this cross-section area is, the lower the resistance. Does that make sense? Sure, imagine there's a hallway, right? And people are trying to pass through this hallway. If we enlarge this hallway by a factor of two, for example, we will, we will know that people can pass more easily. So we would expect that the resistance of the hallway is reduced. So it's the same idea here. Okay, so now that we have this uh, conceptual picture for a resistor in mind, we can actually play with it and derive some simple relations that you might have seen in physics before based on uh, equa Ohm's law and maybe KVL and KCL. So let's start with something very simple and see how that goes. Okay, so what I would like to do is uh, look at uh, this example here. So we ask, what happens if A is uh, doubled? Okay, so of course you immediately say the resistance is reduced by a factor of 2, and that's true. But uh, let's draw this out and see what it looks like. All right, so um, here's the structure that I'm building. I have uh, made the structure twice as wide as this, so that the area is now 2a. And it has the same length as before. So this is the same length and the same material as before. So what I can say is that the resistance has uh, gone to r over 2 because the cross-section area of the structure has gone get up by a factor of 2. All right, that makes sense. Okay, but let's draw this a little differently and see what happens. So, uh, imagine the hallway that I mentioned is a hallway that is this wide, right? So we have this hallway and we put a little thin wall in the middle of the hall hall hallway and nothing changes, right? People can still pass through the hallway with the same resistance as before. So if I redraw the structure as shown here, so I have two of these, one like this, 
one like this each one having a length of L like before so the length hasn't changed the material hasn't changed so we still have the same row and each of these has a cross-section area of A so this is A and this is A and I just uh, connect these two together call that one terminal and connect these together and call that another terminal do you agree that this is the same as this all we did was we just sliced it into two pieces right and the two pieces are still connected by these wires so this structure has a resistance equal to r over 2 if the original one if this one has a resistance of r okay so we say r so this is r so this is r this is r these are the original structures two copies and the result is that we have r over 2 okay now what does this mean let's try to draw these using our symbol so here's the situation i have one resistor of value r i have another resistor of value r and these are connected and these are connected and uh, we have a structure like this so what does it say it says that if you place two equal resistors in parallel the net result will be half of the original value right so this is equivalent to one resistor having a value of r over two so you might remember the rule for parallel resistors and this is another way of proving it just based on first principles and these simple observations right so you see that's very simple okay so that's great. Uh, let's see uh, what other examples we can uh, look at here. All right. Okay. So I would like to go back to Ohm's law and uh, uh, try to talk about the concept of IV characteristics. So let's see if we can uh, change the color of our pen here to blue so we say i v characteristics <clears throat> okay so for resistor we have this equation v equals i r uh, so i can say that v is equal to i r or I can say I is equal to V over R. So, uh, there are two ways of looking at the, a resistor. One is I push a current through the resistor and I get a voltage. This is the cause, this is the effect. Another is to say I apply a voltage across the, across the resistor and I get a current. This is the cause, this is the effect. So depending on which one we consider the cause and which one we consider the effect, we can plot the effect as a function of the cause. So let's go ahead and do that. So for this equation, what's happening is this. I have a resistor. And I am pushing a current through it. How do I push a current through a resistor? Well, maybe put a current source, right? So we put a current source here. I. This current flows this way through the resistor, just like, just like before, generating voltage equal to V. And now I can try to vary I from minus infinity to plus infinity and plot V as a function of I, just like that. So that would be something like this. So we have V as a function of I i is the cause v is the effect i is the input v is the output right so and that gives us a simple line like this the slope of which is r okay all right this is a characteristic that uh, just graphically shows this equation right very simple now how about this guy how do we do that 
So there the cause is the voltage and the effect is the current. So maybe what we should do is we come in with a voltage source like so, V, apply to a resistor and measure the current that flows. So in this case, the input is the voltage and the output of interest is the current. So again, I can plot this as a function of this. So that would be I as a function of V. And this is also a straight line, except that the slope of this line is 1 over R, as we can see from this equation here. All right? So these two are what we call IV characteristics. Of course, they have the same information and nothing beyond what this equation or this equation tell us, right? But it's a good visualization of uh, what uh, this uh, relationship means. So we often rely on these types of uh, plots in analyzing various devices, and these become more important as they go to more complex trans devices, such as transistors, etc., in your future courses. Okay, so uh, now that we have a sort of a definition for IV characteristics, we can say uh, they don't have to be applied only to resistors, right? Can we apply them to other two terminal devices? For example, a current source or a voltage source, right? Those are legitimate two terminal devices. So let's try to do that. Let's try to go to the next page here and see what we can do. Okay, so we're going to go over another example. And try to plot uh, the IV characteristics of a voltage source. So uh, here's a voltage source. I'll draw it as a constant uh, battery, V1. So previously we had the resistor, now we have voltage source. And I would like to plot uh, the IV characteristic of this uh, device. So what should I apply here? For the resistor, we had the options of applying a voltage or applying a current. Here, we really don't have those two options. If I apply a voltage source here, a voltage source fighting a voltage source makes no sense. We can't do that. We get an infinite current here. So I have to apply a current source. So my job is to apply a current source here. Call it Ix. And uh, measure the voltage that this current source generates, Vx. And plot Vx as a function of Ix. Right? So the input is Ix and the output is Vx. Or the cause is Ix and the effect is Vx. And we'd like to plot that. What does it look like? Well, uh, because Vx is equal to V1 under all conditions, right? Uh, a good voltage source says, I want to keep this voltage regardless of how much current you pass through it, right? It could be current, a high current going this way or that way. It doesn't matter, right? It always wants to maintain this voltage. So it's very simple actually. What we get is this. So the voltage or the output of interest as a function of the current or the input of interest is constant. All right. It's a little weird, right? That we have a VI characteristic that has a slope of zero. But that's what a current source does. Uh, that's what a voltage source does. A voltage source wants to maintain the same voltage, this voltage, regardless of the current that we pass through it. All right, so that's the VI uh, characteristic of this voltage source. So if I put this in a black box and I give it to you, and you do this measurement, you come back and say, yes, what I have in the black box is an ideal constant voltage source equal to this much. Right? That's the uh, battery that we have inside the black box. Okay, so let's look at another example in the same vein and uh, see what we can do there. So in this example, the device of interest to us is a current source. So I have a current source in a black box, I1, 
and uh, I am asked to construct the IV characteristic for this device. And again, I have to ask what type of input or excitation should I apply? What is the cause? Well, if I apply a current source here between these two, like an IX, then that current source has to fight this current source. That doesn't make sense. So we have to apply a voltage source. So we apply a voltage source here. And we measure this current. And we say this is the cause, this is the effect. I'm going to try to plot the effect or the output as a function of the cause or the input. Okay, so, well, it just happens that in this case, Ix is just equal to I1, right? Ix is equal to I1. I1 is a constant current source. It always wants to maintain that current. So what we end up with is very simple. We have Ix as a function of the x. Ix is always constant, so we end up with this equation, this type of behavior. All right, so that's interesting. We see that uh, uh, a voltage source has a Vi characteristic with a slope of zero. A current source has an IV characteristic with a slope of zero. Do these satisfy Ohm's law? Not really, right? Ohm's law was always a straight line passing through the origin, right? Neither of these passes through the origin. So we can't really associate Ohm's law to current sources or voltage sources. But we can try to plot their IV or VI characteristics. So we can see that the concept of IV and VI characteristic is more general than Ohm's law, right? It can be applied to any two terminal device that we have. Okay. All right, uh, following Ohm's law, we also need to understand one more point. So uh, let's write it like this. Application of uh, Ohm's law. In many types of circuit analysis, we are often uh, faced with one simple problem. The problem is this. I have a circuit and it has two wires going into, into it, only two wires, two terminals, and I'm asked to find the resistance between these two terminals. Right? There could be all sorts of resistors, different values, parallel series combinations, whatnot, right? And I'm asked to find the resistance between these two terminals. Okay, now I could try to simplify whatever I have in here based on my knowledge of how parallel resistors combine and how series resistors combine, but sometimes that's not even possible. So we need a general procedure for finding the resistance between these two wires. And the procedure is actually very simple. The procedure is always like this. We apply a voltage source called Vx. We uh, measure the resulting current, Ix, and we say the equivalent resistance between these two points is equal to Vx over Ix. And you might note that that would be the slope of V versus I as well, right? If you remember from uh, our previous uh, IV characteristics, but that's a different point. Okay, so this allows us to find uh, uh, the resistance between two wires going into any type of circuit, right? We can always construct a circuit, apply a voltage and measure the current, or you could apply a current source here and measure the voltage. It's the same thing. Again, V over I gives us that equivalent resistance. This comes in handy in the future when we get to, for example, uh, Thevenin and Norton theorems. All right, so uh, let's uh, look at another example here. Okay, so let me change the color of my pen to blue. So 
there's a certain type of light bulb that is no longer really in production. Uh, you might not have seen it if you're very young. Uh, these, car, these light bulbs have a filament in them, they're not LEDs. So uh, conceptually we can draw them like this. Here's a light bulb and uh, inside there's a filament. And when we apply a voltage to the light bulb or a current to the light bulb, what we see is that uh, this filament heats up and it produces light. That's, that's how Edison came up with the idea of the light bulb some 100 years ago or 200 years ago, right? Okay, so here's the situation. So we're going to do a, an IV plot of this light bulb. So here's a Vx, here's Ix. And I would like to plot I versus V. So I change V from some value to some value, and I want to plot I. Okay, so this is what I see in practice. So I, uh, I say, well, that filament looks like a resistor. Maybe it has a low resistance, but it looks like a resistor. It has some, some wire that has some resistance in it, right? So what I would expect is uh, just like a, the IV characteristic of a resistor. So I versus V. So for example, it has to go through zero, of course, right? And then it's a straight line. But as I increase this voltage, what I observe is that uh, this doesn't go up linearly. It actually begins to curve like this, as if it were saturating. And similarly on this side, it goes like this. So why does it do that? So when the voltage and the current are small, meaning the light that it produces is weak, uh, we see sort of a simple uh, linear relationship between I and V. But as we increase this voltage and the current, we begin to see that it's no longer a linear characteristic. Well, this is because as we apply more current and voltage to this filament and it heats up, as it heats up more, as the temperature of the filament goes up, its resistance actually goes up. So around here it has a lower resistance, around here it has a higher resistance. And that's why it begins to produce less current for a given voltage change. So when the resistance is low around here, I change the voltage by some amount, I get this much current. But around here, when I change the voltage by some amount, I get very little change in the current because the filament is hotter, its resistance is higher, so it produces less current. It uh, generates less current. So uh, I'll just write that here. Let us say the filament the filament is hotter uh, as a higher resistance. So this is an example of a case where the uh, the resistor is actually nonlinear. Now, we will not encounter nonlinear resistors anymore in this course, but I just wanted to give you an example of how IV characteristics come in handy when we are studying various devices, including this type of device. All right? Okay, very good. So, uh, let's go over uh, a few more examples of uh, uh, these uh, situations. Uh, so, Okay. All right, so uh, let's uh, talk about uh, uh, applications of Ohm's law in this case and try to find the resistance. So we say find the equivalent resistance of uh, this, uh, this topology. So R1 
R2, two resistors like this. We call this a series combination, and we would like to know what the equivalent resistance is. So if I put this in a black box, and I say this box has only two terminals, like so, how much is the resistance of this box? Okay, so we follow the procedure. We apply Vx, and we measure Ix. Or you can apply the current source and measure the voltage. It's the same thing. The ratio is always a V over I, according to Ohm's law, right? That's the resistance. Okay, so how do we do this? I have to find Ix in terms of Vx and R1 and R2. All right, well, this current comes in, it flows through R1. When a current flows through a resistor, Ohm's law says that we will generate a voltage. How much is the voltage? The voltage across this resistor from here to here. How much is that? Ohm's law says current times resistance. So let me change the color of my pen here to red. So this voltage will be Ix times R1, right? Ohm's law, current times resistance. How about the voltage across R2? Same idea, right? This current comes in, flows through R1, flows downward, flows through R2, goes back. So the current through R2 is Ix, and that current times R2 gives us the voltage across R2. So this voltage is Ix R2. Okay, all right. So I have found the voltage drops across these two resistors, and now I can say, by looking at the circuit, that this voltage is equal to this voltage plus this voltage, right? This is really Kirchhoff's voltage law, which we will study later, but it's sort of intuitively obvious, right? This potential difference plus this potential difference is this potential difference. So I can say that Vx is equal to Ix R1 plus Ix R2. And that means that uh, Vx over Ix, which is the equivalent resistance that we are interested in, this equivalent resistance, is given by R1 plus R2. Again, this is something you have seen before. If we have two resistors in series, uh, then their values add. The equivalent value is the sum of the two. There's only one question. How do I know if two resistors are in series? If I have some very complex structure and I'm looking at two resistors, how do I guarantee that these are in series? Okay, so we have to find the definition of series resistors, right? So definition So we say two resistors <coughs> are in series <coughs> if they share if they share only one terminal only one terminal And, this is important, and have the same current. Okay? So if I draw these in isolation, just like this, R1, R2, you see that these two share this terminal. These two terminals join together here, and whatever flows through R1 has to flow through R2, right? There's no branching here. Nothing can go out of this node to anywhere else. And then these two are in series, okay? So long as you remember these two conditions, sharing only one node and carrying the same current, you can always identify series combinations. Okay, so that's an example of applying Ohm's law to determining the resistance of two resistors in series. And you can see that the same ideas can be applied to parallel resistors. So let me give you a definition of parallel resistors also. So definition. 
So we say two resistors are in parallel if they if they share both terminals that's all we need to say because if they do share both terminals they automatically have the same voltage anyway so that's uh, good enough for determining whether two resistors are in parallel or not so here are two resistors in parallel and what we see is that they share these two terminals they share these two terminals and because they're doing that, this voltage, the voltage across R1 and the voltage across R2 are equal. There's no other way. Uh, this wire guarantees that these two nodes are shorted. And this wire guarantees that these two nodes are shorted. So the voltage between these two points is zero. The voltage between these two points is zero. So the voltage across R1 is equal to voltage across R2. So if you want to be safe, you can always say share both terminals and have the same voltage but that comes automatically with sharing the both terminals anyway. So these two definitions are critical to remember uh, because once we get to more complex circuits, it may not be straightforward to identify series or parallel resistors. All right, this concludes the lecture today. I will see you next time.